Okay, guys, I think we are now live for another weekly edition of Nomberg Law Live, as we do every Tuesday at 10 o'clock Central, 8 a.m. Pacific. We try to bring you interesting conversations with people in their areas of expertise. And today I am so honored and so happy to have Bakari Sellers from South Carolina with me today. Good morning, Bakari. Thank you for having me. And let me apologize for looking like Tom Hanks from Castaway, but uh in quarantine this is this is about as good as you get right now hey we'll take any version we can get my friend and i appreciate you spending a little bit of time with us and for folks who don't know bakari you really should know his story he has not yet reached the age of 36 if i'm correct are you still 35 <laughs> still a few, 35, more, a few more months bakari yes. has a a just a and a very interesting history so far and he's only 36 years of age the youngest African American ever elected into a state house legislation a legislator at age 22 a product of Morehouse College University of South Carolina Law School and so much more the the stories and really where I intersected with Bakari and I only recently reminded him of this is he spoke to a national lawyers work comp conference back in October out in California and told his family's story, the story of his father, who I believe, am I correct, that this new book that's coming out is really kind yeah. of a, a memoir and a tribute to your father, Cleve, if I may call yeah, it it's a, Yeah, no, no doubt. It's a, it's a memoir and a continuation of, of his story. He uh, wrote the autobiography, The River of No Return, and this uh, kind of picks up and continues that that journey. So, um, yes, and we had a fun time in California. Who would have guessed uh, just a couple of months ago after our, our meeting in California, we would end up here. But life life changes and we have to take every every day and enjoy it to the fullest. That's that's exactly right. And that's I want to start, Bakari, you're at your home in South Carolina. I know you've got at least what one child young child or, or more than no one? i have i have multiple so i have twins that are 15 <laughs> months old I, that one boy one girl stokely and sadie and then i have a 14 year old stepdaughter um who's trying to do virtual school um but you know we're just working through it kind of one day at a time to say the least oh wow like like we all are but i appreciate you you spending some time with us today and and as we said right before we came on we don't have a huge agenda there's not really a written script for us to talk today but i want to for people who don't know you for people sure. who have not had the pleasure of having a conversation with you yet tell the tell people a little bit more about yourself and and what you do in south sure. carolina well i currently people may see me on cnn i haven't been on as much over the past four weeks because i, I don't have a master's in public health um and we are we are steering uh, slightly away from politics more into public health dealing with coronavirus um, but I've been a CNN political commentator since 2015. Uh, prior to that, we'll kind of go backwards in my history. I, in 2014, I was the Democratic nominee for lieutenant governor um, in the great state of South Carolina. I was the youngest person. I was 30 years old when I won that nomination. Um, prior to that, I served in the General Assembly for eight years. I, I refer to myself as the best type of legislator. Um, I'm retired. That's always the best type of legislator. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I was 22 years old when I got elected. I was the youngest uh, black elected official in the country and the youngest state legislator in the country. Um, it was just an awesome experience. Graduated from Morehouse College, the University of South Carolina School of Law. I practice at the Strom Law Firm now. Do a lot of, uh, we're, we're a boutique plaintiff's firm. I, I guess that's the trendy adjective to call it now, but it's an amazing place to work. And I do a lot of, uh, I do absolutely everything, and except um, I do no uh, no no immigration work, and I do no family no family court work. Um, but I, I think the unique part of my story is that uh, my life has been bookmarked by tragedy or bookend by tragedy. Um, I tell people the most important day of my life is February 8, 1968. It's the day of the Orangeburg massacre in Orangeburg, South Carolina. My father. Um, and 28 others were shot and wounded, and three were killed on the campus of South Carolina State while they were protesting the segregated all-star bowling alley, which was across the street from the from the university. Um, and then in June of 2015, um, I lived through one of my good friends and um, uh, one of my colleagues, his Senate district overlapped my house district, Clemente Pinckney, who was the uh, pastor at Mother Emanuel Amy Church when Dylan Roof walked in and murdered nine people um, and injured three others. And so uh, 
you know, I, I uh, was on Morning Joe. No, I was on MSNBC with um, Melissa Harris Perry, standing in front of Mother Amy Church um, soon after that incident. And I recall um, stating that my father was 70 and I was 30 at the time, and we were still having many of the same shared experiences. And so it troubled me about the direction and trajectory of our country. I um, mean, now I have a book um, coming out um, in about five weeks, six weeks, called My Vanishing Country. Um, and I talk about the plight of, of not just being black in America, but growing up in the rural parts of America um, uh, and emerging from those dirt roads and the culture that comes with that. Um, people are comparing it to uh, J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy, um, which was an amazing book. I mean, hopefully it, it's that well received. But other than that, my, my goals in life, and you'll appreciate this, is uh, number one, to be a really good husband, and number two, to be a really good father. And those things are works in progress. They, they always are. They always <laughs> are. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit of your, your background, Bakari. I saw where you posted recently a fantastic picture of yourself with your father and Jesse Jackson from, Not I yet. think, the 88 campaign because you I don't know if you had been born or just born in the 84 campaign but you look to be a little toddler in that picture so I'm assuming it was 88. Yeah I um it was 88 I was four years old um during the first I was born during the first campaign in September of the first campaign my father and Jesse were really really close my father was um a member of the student nonviolent coordinating committee SNCC in the 60s and Jesse was of course uh, SCLC very close to um, Dr. King and ran Operation Breadbasket, but they were very close. Our families were so uh, intertwined that um, little Jesse, as we refer to him, um, uh, actually Jesse Jr. actually used to babysit when he went to North Carolina. And he and my family lived in Greensboro, North Carolina. That picture, if people go to my Facebook or Twitter, um, is a picture from the 88 campaign when I was effectively the campaign baby. So everywhere that you saw uh, uh, Jesse with a baby, that baby was usually me. My father was a regional uh, field director. And my little known trivia fact, uh, my father was the person who hired a young lady named Donna Brazil and gave her her start in democratic wow. politics back in 1984 on the Jesse Jackson campaign. Wow, that, that is a little, no, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Well, let's, let's back up even further. You mentioned the, um, the February of 1968 uh, time period during the massacre at South Carolina State at the bowling alley. Uh, just two months later, Dr. King was assassinated, which just as an FYI, a little just to me, I was born about six days before that in Baltimore, Maryland. And if you you may know this, but back back in the old days, moms and, and babies didn't get out of the hospital a day or two later like they do today. You stayed in the hospital for several days. Oh, I didn't know so, that. And and I'm from the state of Alabama. I was born in Baltimore because that's where my dad was stationed at the time in the military. Well, trying to leave the city of Baltimore two days after Dr. King was assassinated with my family having Alabama tags on the car, my parents tell the story that that was one rough day to try to get out of the hospital and, and leave. Yeah. As you can imagine, the riots having begun but that's just a, a small side note. But I want to stay in that 1968 time period because I know it's so important in the United States history and I know it's important in your family's history. You were born 16 years later in 84, but by this point your father had been through a lifetime of, of life lessons, the, the yeah. good and the bad. And yeah. I know that that made such an impression on how you have brought, have come through your life. And now that you have small children, Let's talk a little bit about that because it seems to be, if for anybody who knows you sees that that's kind of a pattern that you're following and it must feel, and maybe you don't feel this, such responsibilities that you have to carry on certain messages. I'd like you to, yeah. to kind of talk about that. So, uh, you know, Tom Brokaw wrote a book and it ended up becoming a documentary. It's called Boom 1968. I recommend everybody go and pick it up. Um, because 1968 was the year the country was on fire. I know it feels like the country's proverbially on fire recently, but in 1968, you had a ton of soldiers coming back from Vietnam. You had the Orangeburg Massacre in February, April 4th of 68. You had the death and assassination of King. 
then in June, you have the assassination of RFK. And so the first half in 1968, um, as Tom Brokaw said, the country was just aflame. Um, and there was so much going on. And my father, his experiences from being arrested, um, being denied a bond, being housed on death row, um, serving on a, in a death row cell while his bond was denied next to one of the most infamous, um, one of the most infamous serial killers we've uh, ever had in South Carolina, Pee Wee Gaskin, um, going all the way through um, to, uh, you know, actually getting his degree from Harvard um, in between the time of his the February 8th and the actual trial. Um, and then uh, after he uh, got his degree going to trial, being found guilty by 10 whites and two blacks um, and being, being his indictment. And you'll appreciate this in your legal practice. His indictment was backdated from February 8th to February 6th. Um, and he was charged, tried and convicted of rioting. Um, and this little guy right here who joins us here, this is Stokely. Stokely is um, named after Stokely Carmichael, who was my dad's uh, very good friend. Um, and um, uh, hopefully, as you talked about the pressure of living up to that legacy, we try to pass it down and make sure that our little people um, grow up understanding uh, those struggles. In the book, though, I, I, I talk about that. My mom struggles and some of the mental health uh, issues and concerns we had because uh, raising and growing up with a family, um, you know, raising my daughter was born while my father was in prison. Mm -hmm. And the first time my father actually saw my daughter was on the, my, my sister was on the um, prison yard. And just those stresses and pressures of actually growing up during that time frame in my family, uh, living through that, um, that time period and my father having a felony in the South, um, you know, while we were being brought up, the difficulty of, of finding a job and going through those things, um, you know, creates an extra weight, probably makes me more bitter um, than, than he is. But it also shows me that uh, our, our journey is not yet complete. And so that's the task and the path. And, you know, one of the things that we try to do with making sure that uh, Stokely and his sister Sadie, um, uh, you know, they inherit a, a more free um, democracy and a more perfect union than the one that I did and the one my father did and just continue to pass that down. Well, the examples that you lead, not only in your actions, but also your, your words are certainly ones that I'm sure your children in later in life will certainly come to, to appreciate. I know that we come to appreciate it now as adults or young adults who are following you, but thank you for setting such examples uh, because more people should, should follow uh, setting such examples. So thank you for that. Uh, we try, especially in, uh, in Alabama, you guys. The Alabama, a lot like South Carolina, is unique because um, – and it's something that I take to heart and I write about a lot that you don't have to um, read about the civil rights movement and you don't have to go out and search for civil rights heroes because they're all around you every single day. Um, you know, you, all you have to do is go to the grocery store you, you, or the barbershop and you see someone who marched with King or someone who, uh, you know, was a part of, of, of Selma um, and, you know, those stories or, or did their own work um, in, in Dallas County. Um, um, and and so th th it's an it's important, especially these rural stories, these southern stories get told. And so I'm just thankful for the opportunity to be here with you and also um, to be able to share those stories as we go. Well, thank you. And, and I live close to downtown Birmingham and my office is close to downtown. And I've had the honor and pleasure of having on my show several such local members who were lived through fought through and endured through the, the civil rights movement just from all different walks of life. But Carl, we have too many people who are here watching us live to for me to mention them. I'll just say that they're from all over the country right now. So I wanna welcome everybody spending a few minutes with me speaking with South Carolina attorney, Bakari Sellers. We're talking just all over the board really a little bit about things. Let's talk a little bit now about what keeps you busy when you're not practicing law when you're not on TV being a commentator, when you're not chasing children around the house or in the neighborhood, what things do you like to do that on those 10 minutes of downtime, what do you like to do when you get away? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I, I don't feel like maybe I don't, I don't get, a, get away. I, I, I read um, a lot of uh, news magazines. Those are my kind of go-to, the Atlantic's, the New York Times magazine, um, some of the more in-depth 
periodicals, Politico, um, when they get beyond some of the more um, clickbaity things and write those four or five, six thousand uh, word pieces. And so that's that's what I do. And, and you know, it, it's not really getting away from my job because it helps me um, from for my job. And right now I find myself digging into more research about what's happening in the dispar dis uh, disparities that are occurring in the way that um, uh, the coronavirus is affecting us. So I know it's not really downtime. Um, you know, being in Alabama, I was uh, w reading and working with a friend of mine who's a reporter from Alabama, Michael Harriet, and discussing how Al uh, Alabama has the highest death rate coronavirus in the entire country, in the entire country, and it's going to have the fourth most incidence of cases in the country. One of my good friends from Morehouse College, I'm another Morehouse man, is, is right down the street from me there. Uh, he was the SGA president the year before I was the SGA president at Morehouse, Randall Wolfen, uh, the mayor of Birmingham. And so um, as they, as we, as they, um, you know, we talk about corona response, or, uh, I mean, that's what we, we, in our chat group of 30 some things, we're talking about how cities should respond to coronavirus. I mean, I don't, it's an interesting time that we're living in. And so, um, you know, just, uh, in my my spare time, I'm still um, working, I guess, to make this better and um, work through some of the disparate um, ways in which our um, healthcare system treats our, our own. Well, if you haven't talked, you beat me to the punch. If you hadn't talked to Mayor Woodfin in a while or this week, send some love to him. He is, in my humble opinion, a fantastic leader. I've met him many times. He has been so proactive in helping to protect not just the people in our county, Jefferson County, but as many of who come in contact with him. And I have seen him many, many times. It could be eight, nine o'clock at night, not during this pandemic. I'm talking about all year round. He is checking on the homeless. He is checking in with the city leaders all during the day. He's always available. I can't say enough good things about Mayor Woodfin. So if you see him, make sure you, you I will pass that along. I actually was uh, there's a I don't know the name of the coffee shop, but it was just a little coffee shop that we met at back when he first started his campaign downtown Birmingham. Um, I was staying at a I think it's a little Hilton across from UAB, a little Hilton Garden Inn or something like that. And he picked me up and we went down and we sat there and um, not people in the restaurant, but everybody who worked at the restaurant and Every, when we went outside, it was the people who um, drove the buses, mm -hmm. who were the sanitation truck drivers. They all knew him. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew something special was going to happen in that race when I saw that type of response that he was getting from just average, everyday um, um, working folk in, in Birmingham. And so, um, you know, they, you got a good little nexus of public officials down there, um, you know, not just Birmingham, but also in Little Rock with Frank Scott. Um, you know, Memphis is always ticking along, and so I'm proud of the work that you all are doing, and I, I hope uh, that, that Governor Ivey and others um, allow science to, to, to lead and public health to lead um, and save some lives in Alabama. Well, from your lips to those who make decisions ears, we certainly hope that that occurs. Uh, I, I'm a little skeptical so far what's occurred, but I'm hopeful for the future for, for our right. state and for right. other states. I'm going to throw some some things to you and you just sure. tell me what they mean to you. Sure. While I breathe, I hope. Dum spiro spero. Um, that's that is uh, while I breathe, I hope in Latin. It is our state motto. Um, it encompasses a lot of, of what us Southerners believe in, which is the faith of a mustard seed. And while we breathe, we hope. Um, and so at every ounce of our breath, we continue to hope that we create a more perfect union and um, and continue to be a part of something larger than ourselves. I don't have the title of your memoir in front of me. I apologize, or I would have used that as my next quote. My Vanishing Which, Country. My Vanishing you. Country. Yeah. Tell me what that title means to you. So My Vanishing Country, it starts um, in rural Denmark, South Carolina, where I'm from. And... Um, it talks about uh, the fact that you no longer see the twinkle in the eyes of these small cities anymore uh, throughout the rural poor south. Um, these cities that were once bastions of economic growth, you now ride through Main Street and, um, you know, the, the door, the, the, the windows are shuttered. Um, 
the, the, all the businesses that were once there when we were coming up, and I can only imagine when you were coming up, are, are no longer there. Um, and so uh, the, the country, and I use country in the sense of, of not the United States of America country, um, but country folk, um, the country folk that we are and that we came up with, the essence of that is vanishing. And then I, I kind of migrate that into the fact that, um, you know, when we talk about things in this country, such as rural America, um, you know, the media, um, some of my colleagues, they use rural America just to mean white. And we know you in Alabama, me in South Carolina, we know that there are a lot of black rural folk too. Um, and so, um, you know, we just talk about the fact that this whole, that we still have time to rebuild this country that we love, but right now it's, it appears that over the past, you know, 20, 30 years, it's been vanishing before our eyes. Well, well said, thank you. What right now, if you can, do you have any more political aspirations at this point that you wish to discuss? This is oh, Sadie. Look, look at her, hey so Sadie. We, you were with her brother a minute ago. <laughs> and this is Sadie, uh, yeah, always. So we will, you know, my goal is to run for Congress um, in the near future, uh, uh, maybe 22. I mean, I, you know, a lot of that depends on how quickly Jim Clyburn sees this interview that I'm doing right now. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, he's throughout not on the my staff. friends list, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, he, it's it's a mystery how he ends up with so much uh, material. Um, but you know, we we, um, we we shall see. I I, uh, I enjoy being um, in the General Assembly. I enjoy being retired from the General Assembly. Um, and you know, my goal is to go to Congress. But you never know; those those plans always always change. And so we'll see what happens. But you know, hopefully, get back out there sooner. I miss the campaign aspect and talking to people and eating fried fish and doing all those things. <laughs> well, do you ever get a chance to sleep? When do you rest? I, I sleep now, we you. sleep now. We we just, we, we're sleep training these babies now. And so my wife says their prayers and uh, rocks them and puts them to bed at like 8.30. Mm -hmm. And so we've been actually the last four or five, uh, quarantine has done us some some good sleeping, but when we don't, uh, when, when we're out of quarantine, I'm usually, traveling three or four days a week, giving speeches or, or I'm working and I'm doing all of those things. So this has been, uh, I'm ready to be free again, but this has been good to, to kind of settle down and recharge and spend time uh, with, with the babies. You know, I've, I've talked with my parents and older generation, people who are part of my life, asking them, when can you ever remember a time like we're going through right now, when life has just completely slowed down from the normal, and we're now in what, I hate this term, the new normal, what we're adjusting to is gonna be life going forward. Really, the only thing that's come up, it really isn't during the war time, because the wars were not on our soils, but really the only thing that they have, or anybody has mentioned, is really after 9-11, and that was only for a, an abbreviated, really, period of time. Has anybody discussed with you any memories they have of when well, life has really just kind of slowed down like this? Not, no. Uh, this is, I don't, I do know one, this was a story we ran on CNN. There was one, one young man, I use young loosely, but uh, he lived through the Spanish flu and now he's living through this. <laughs> but as you wow. can probably guess, he's over he's over a hundred years yeah. old. Uh, so there hasn't been anybody who who has really lived through this. But I, I will give you another perspective, and your viewers another perspective. Imagine, you know, we give millennials a lot of grief, um, but millennials have lived through not only this coronavirus but also 9/11, and just imagine the trauma that uh, that comes with all of that. And then even Generation Z, um, uh, March this. This uh, past March was the first month. Uh, this is a random fact. Don't ask me why or how I know this. But this uh, this March was the first um, first uh, month since um, twenty since two thousand and two that we didn't have a school shooting. And so, um, I mean, the only reason we didn't is because we we weren't in school. But just think about. Uh, that is, we go through and talk about this young generation and how things change and the amount of trauma they go through now. You know, we don't want pandemics, but, you know, pandemics and school shooting and violence and terror are, are part of the fabric of, of, you know, who we are now, um, which is, is more than unfortunate. 
Well, I've got a question to throw to you from a buddy of mine, Johnny Finch, who's an attorney in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and here's his question. First of all, he says, good morning to you. How do you compare being in a courtroom trial in comparison to, from that to being on live TV in debates? Which do you think is better? Which do you enjoy more? Well, I love them both. I love being, I, I'm a trial lawyer through and through, so I love being in front of a jury. Um, they have some similar elements, uh, but let me tell you this. Um, when I'm on TV, I never ever try to change the mind of the person I'm talking to. There is no change in Rick Santorum's mind. It just ain't. Uh, Mar Marsha Blackburn, I used to be on with her, the United States Senator from Tennessee, ain't no change in her mind. Um, so you're usually speaking to the um, individuals watching. Um, and so the, the slight difference is you're always, when you're in front of that jury, you're trying to get one, two, six, seven of those jurors to believe you. When I'm speaking to my colleagues on TV, I ain't trying to, to, to get them uh, to, to believe anything I say, because that's a fool's mission. My father gives me a good piece of advice that I'll, uh, I'll, um, I'll pass on to you. It's really good when you're on TV, and it's really good when you're crossing or directing a witness, or crossing a witness. Um, never argue with a fool, because the people watching can't tell the difference. And so uh, whether or not those are viewers on TV or whether or not that is my jury, I keep that in mind all the time. Well, that is sound advice. And that leads me to my, and we're getting close to the end and I appreciate sure. your time. I'm asking a father-son dynamics question. I still have them. My dad is happily retired in Gulf Shores and he's probably watching right now. Good. At what point in a, in when, when your father is giving you sage advice, or at least sage advice in his mind, are you saying to yourself, Dad, I, I know, I've got this, or are you you're still soaking it in every day? I'm still soaking it in because the, the advice he's giving me now is on how to be a father, and everything I thought I knew uh, doesn't. It don't it doesn't comport. <laughs> I, I was I put it on Twitter yesterday that I, nobody ever told me that being a father or parent of toddlers you'd be reduced to just saying don't put that in your mouth. I said that about a thousand times yesterday. That that's our go-to. Uh, so whenever my father wants to give me some sage advice on on parenthood, I gladly take it. Excellent, excellent. Rapid fire, three or four questions, and we're sure. done. And I appreciate your time. Favorite sport to participate in. Activity wise, uh, participate in basketball. Favorite sport that you follow? Oh, there's nothing like SEC college football. Oh, huge right Gamecock. There. Right yeah. there. Well, except for that, but right and there. No worries. I'm a You're... Vandy grad. <laughs> Do they play football at Vanderbilt? I can't remember. Oh, easy now. Easy now. <laughs> we got other sports there too. Uh, and I played for Vanderbilt, so football, so we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> what's your favorite? Uh, social media platform to be a stalker? A stalker Instagram, participant Twitter. There you go. Uh, favorite TV show that is a former reality show? That's a good question. I don't really, I watch a, I watch a lot of free movies on demand and CBS on demand because I love NCIS. All of those like uh, Law & Order, I watch a lot of dumb TV, things that I don't have to focus on because my life is so compressed. So I, and I just don't do a lot of reality TV. My life is a reality show. The, the, the love that sister show isn't on loop anymore. No, see, there you go. I knew that was coming. Uh, All right, it's actually, it's actually, it's actually on, I'm not, I tell, I remind people often, I'm the only person who I, I've gone from being um, on a reality show to being hired by CNN in the same year. I, I, I think I hold that distinction. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Bakari, I'm going to give you the last word. And I, and again, I really appreciate your time, particularly your home. You've got the children. I know you've got a lot of things going on. Give us some something to think about going forward. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Hopefully people, we're now in what week four, week five. People are settling in a little bit, but they are restless. Yeah. What are some things that maybe you share with with your constituents or your friends, your family, that maybe gives them a little pause and maybe a little hope? So, I mean, I always tell people, first thing, always check on your strong friends, right? The ones who you think can overcome anything, the ones who you think are the, you know, you always got those people who you feel like their life is always going perfectly. Check on those people um, because, you know, even during this, they have rough days too. Um, and this is so much time that, 
Um, it, it's the perfect time to, if you have a, a business, to make it that much better. If you're thinking about a business or always wanted to start a business, and you just said that you never had the time to, now's the time. And I, my whole thing to people is just be better when we come out of this than you were when you went in. So I work out every day, read more, spend more time with family. Um, just try to be physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally healthy. Um, and I think that when we emerge from this, we'll all emerge better. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing some time with me today. Thank you. And I encourage everyone, if they can, to go out and get My Vanishing Country, either from uh, you know your neighborhood bookstore or Barnes & Noble, or go to harpercollins.com and pick it up. It's a, it's a good read, so thank you. I'm going to put the links to your website and to the Amazon link to the book in the show notes here so folks can just click on those. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Bakari, thank you. Have a great day, my friend. You too now. Bye-bye.